Great, thank you. Um, yeah, good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here at the 8th Battery Minerals Conference here in Perth, and thanks again to the uh, PADA team for putting on another successful event. Um, today I'd like to talk about our flagship Mount Lindsay Critical Minerals project, the critical minerals being tin and tungsten, which I don't think I covered in this um, uh, conference at all, so I uh, hope I'll get a chance that you walk away and you learn a bit about the two commodities, which uh, were called strategic until just recently, until it became critical throughout the world. Uh, that's located in northwest Tasmania. Uh, and also talk a bit about Chalice Mining's activity at our Southwest project here in, in WA. Now, the Mount Lindsay project um, is a um, tin tungsten project. It's already had $40 million spent on it. Uh, we have over 100,000 metres of diamond core drilling. We completed an open pit feasibility study in 2012, so that's over 10 years ago. And, um, and we have one of the largest undeveloped tin tungsten deposits in the world. The project's located in the tier one jurisdiction because it's already net zero emissions. We've got access to renewable energy, we've got hydropower running past our door through the project, so we've got access to that. Tin prices, even though they have come off a fair bit, are still above the 10-year average and it's still three times the price of copper. Certainly with the green economy, we're looking to develop certainly the time for tin, which is definitely an EV metal, is now. There's the disclaimer. Um, we commenced the, I suppose, the underground feasibility, which, is, which we're still working on at the moment, uh, with collecting 10 tonnes of samples. So we did that to try and verify a, a new, uh, simpler processing route. And that metallurgical program was uh, you know, the focus of a lot of our work for the majority of last year and early this year. We also focused on doing a new mine design. Instead of being an open pit with a 200 hectare footprint, reducing dramatically that footprint to being an underground mine, a smaller plant, smaller tailing facilities, and then eventually putting all that waste rock and tailings back down the hole, back to a mine which was started back over 100 years ago. There's also you know, a bit about, um, you know, we've done re restarted exploration of Mount Lindsay and had some early success there, I'll, t I'll touch on that. We found some rare earths also sitting at Mount Lindsay, so it's certainly a treasure trove of elements we have at Mount Lindsay, which is pretty much synonymous with Tasmanian generals. I'll go through that in a second. Uh, Chalice Mining pushed the button on going to stage two and uh, to spend a, uh, up to another two and a half million dollars to take it from 51 to 70 percent interest. So I'll talk a bit about that. The Riley or Iron Ore Mine remains in care and maintenance and uh, ready for a quick restart with the right uh, market conditions. And I won't touch much more on the Golden Grove North and Coolum projects because I'll be running out of time for that today. Uh, just a quick corporate snapshot, um, top 20%, uh, 24%, the company has been listed since 2006. Dale Elphinstone is still the largest shareholder on the register. Uh, you can see the tin price, how it's fluctuated quite a bit. About 12 months ago, it was trading at $50,000. In October last year, it was $17,000. In January, it was $33,000. Today, it's $22,000, so talk about volatility. Um, the, uh, the board, um, you know, all those members there, we were there since the beginning of the project. So when uh, that hiatus between about 2014 through to about 2017, 18, um, we still kept the team together during those tough times and we were able to sort of swing onto the Mount Lindsay project and eventually produce the first shipment of iron ore back in September 2021. So segueing onto Mount Lindsay was good because all the in-house knowledge still existed. Uh, we've got several projects throughout uh, you know, that hiatus period. We, we pegged ground in, 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 in WA, back home, south, including the Southwest project, which is obviously a well-recognised asset by Chalice. We've got ground at Coolin and Golden Grove, which is a very, just, just north of the Golden Grove mine itself. But now zooming into the, onto the um, west coast of Tassie, and a lot of you may not know there's a mining industry there that's been going for 140 years. You know, when I was working underground at Linston Nickel Operations in the mid-80s, all the best jumper operators and airleggers came from Rosebury and Mount Lyle. These are household names in the industry. Anyone who's been in the industry for length of time I've been or, or longer would know these names. Savage River's Australia's only magnetite mine since running since 1966. Mount Lyle about to restart. King Island's about to restart Australia's only real tungsten mine. Rosebury's been going for nearly 90 years. Renison Bell, Australia's only tin mine been going for nearly 130 years. 
great amount of history. And Mount Lindsay, along with that, has its own history. Here we are, a picture from 1914. Um, as you can see, that uh, the, the devastation from the pulling out, knocking the timber down. It's all regrowth now, uh, opposite the claims of other groups. Uh, here's another picture at Mount Lindsay, another previously mined area called the Reward Area. Uh, you can see the pipeline uh, hydraulically blasting the alluvial gravels to extract the tin that's out of it. And that was back in 1911, so that's around the Stanley River area. Uh, a little bit about tin, just, just briefly. Um, it's all part of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's, it's all about solder, which is the glue that joins everything electronic together. Without the solder, aka without tin, and, and solder is 96% tin, you don't have anything electric works. All your circuitry require, it does not work. So without tin, we have no opportunity to go this green electrific electrification economy. So that's very important. You can see the solar cells in the tin, tin foil, electric vehicles and the anodes of batteries, uh, energy storage, recycling. So that's very synonymous with the future we're heading towards. So tin's very important. It's called the spice metal as well, by the way. Uh, a little bit more about tin, all the 5G network that gets rolled out, that'll require more circuitry. There's 400 grams of tin per electric vehicle. Um, there's uh, there's a, a charging stations up to a kilogram of tin sitting in each charging station. We require 30% more share for more uh, uh, tin to be produced by 2030, and tin continues to be used as a catalyst for improving things like the storage capacity, lithium-ion batteries, etc. And the question I hear you all asking is, where does tin come from today? And Wood Mackenzie said uh, nearly a couple of years ago now that the world has most of its tin coming from areas of high geopolitical risk. And you can look at those, China, Russia, Indonesia, Egypt, Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, Congo, Myanmar. So it's a, it's a pretty risky sort of bunch you've got there in the tin market. Half the tin's alluvially produced. It's not responsibly sourced, unlike Mount Lindsay, which is a hard rock tin resource. It's in Australia. We meet all the ESG credentials uh, just by definition with all our, our uh, laws in place. So you know, if, you want to, if you want to have this responsibly sourced tin, places like Australia is a great place to produce it. Un unbeknown to most people, there was a tin conference last June. Uh, and the Indonesians announced a plan to restrict exporting a tin. That could happen any day. And what will happen is very much like the not nickel market, they'll be looking for downstream investment. So all in country. Um, so sustainable tin is the key to achieving the UN development goals and the green economy. The world needs another 50,000 tonnes, or 12 to 13 per cent more tin per annum to meet this new technology super cycle. Okay, enough about tin. A little bit about tungsten, and, and I think it's topical here with our, with our American friends here at the moment. Um, I'll talk about, the, you know, one of the most interesting uses for tungsten is, is the military aspect. In 2021, 8% of the tungsten use was in the military. Now, what's going to happen between 2021 and 2031, we're going to produce 35, we need 35% more tungsten in the world. Currently, 85% of that comes from China. 22% of that growth will come from defence. So we're going to actually need double the amount of tungsten we produce today. And a lot of that's because of the fact that NATO and the US and Korea are supplying metal, uh, weapons and they're rich in tungsten. Examples, there's 120 kilograms of tungsten in a high Mars warhead. There's 40 kilograms of tungsten in a Sabot armour-piercing shell. Tungsten, because of its hardness and high melting temperature, is used to pierce and, and destroy tanks. Unless they're armour-plated, of course, that's the natural defence. So tungsten, strategic metal if you like, it's on the critical mineral list for the US and for just about every country in the world. Tin is on the US uh, list as well. A uh, bit more about Mount Lindsay. Of course, you know, we're sitting in that sort of EV metal, critical minerals thematic with the two. We've got, you know, a, a very, over 80,000 tonnes of tin metal and resource. We've got 3.2 million metric tonnes of tungsten sitting in the same rock. And we've also got 15% of rock is magnetite, so we can produce a 65% con. This is truly a polymetallic project. One, the McDonald chute, more tin rich, Radford chutes, more, more tungsten rich. They're 150 metres apart, they run parallel, uh, and they're inside Mount Lindsay itself. The resource, we did that back in 2012, obviously looking at the lower cutoffs, uh, for the higher cutoffs for the, um, for the underground grades. Um, like I said before, 100,000 metres of drilling. 70% of that is a measured indicated category. 
So it's very, very well drilled out. The centre parts are done like 20 by 50 metre spacing, all diamond core. Uh, the tin price is above the 10 year average. Tungsten is double what it was in 2016, and that's been slowly creeping up. But these markets, um, as the government will confess, are not, they're very opaque. So these prices are not, do not reflect demand and certainly the, the dominance by China. If China is able to secure the Indonesian supply, we could see they have a very similar situ situation to tungsten. Um, so a bit more, I'll sort of move on to the exploration just quickly. Um, we've been uh, drilling the, uh, the Renison mine sequence with the Renison style targets. You can see Mount Lindsay sitting there in the, uh, in the top here. So we're focusing on this here at the moment. In fact, we're drilling there at, the very, at this very, still, still drilling there at this very moment. Um, we had some early success here on this Renison mine sequence. It's Renison, 130 years of mining just down the road here. Uh, this area was never drilled. This is an alluvial tin field, which I showed pictures of before. So we're drilling that area at the moment. We had some early success with some scar and mineralisation, as you can see from that image. Uh, we then drilled uh, a long strike to Mount Lindsay in the southeast creek target. And we had, again, very similar style, Mount Lindsay style mineralisation. So very early success. What we found is when we went back and looked at some of our core at our reward prospect, we got assays of rare earths, which is a bit of a bonus in the clay zones around it. So you can see some of those assays, you know, um, you know over 1,000 ppm uh, total rare earths are, are uh, sort of assays you see in a, in a rare earth project by itself. So that could be a nice bonus for the reward prospect. Um, we also found in those gravels, which we spoke about being alluvially blasted for uh, tin, we also found some very high grade rare earths. So we're, uh, we're gathering more information, trying to find out the source of that and the scale of that opportunity. We also found another target here, that's Reward, sitting just here, uh, called Cruncher. We've completed that hole now, so we're testing a brand new rare earth slash tin target. Sounds similar to what we would have at the Reward Prospect. So interesting opportunities for a potential rare earth uh, addition to that. Um, also, uh, uh, right, just announced just recently, we're drilling this nickel target, which is sitting, that's Mount Lindsay, Riley Mine sitting here. It's a big EM target, uh, highly anomalous uh, nickel valleys at surface, so we're currently drilling that hole as well. So again, this is, third, this is the same ultramafic that holds the Avery deposit, which John will talk about at this conference. Um, so massive target, uh, sitting in the same belt, 25 kilometres away, is a, is, a, is a nickel mine that's restarting. So that's a pretty exciting opportunity as well. Uh, just quickly touch on the Chalice Pro uh, JV. Um, when it was, discovery was made in March 2020, three months later we did JV with Chalice that came knocking on our door. And you can see that the land package we have in the southwest is in that same corridor that, that Chalice have identified as being highly prospective for these nickel copper PG opportunities. Uh, we've also got the Coolum project just out here. Um, the main reason we did the JV, this is the MAG, the similar. The Tor target at Southwest, the Julemar, very, very similar targets looking. We had EM as well. We hit massive sulphide. This is two years before Julemar was discovered. We had nickel, copper, cobalt. We were looking for a VMS, copper, lead, zinc deposit. So we're sort of scratching our head with that until uh, they made a discovery, that new Julemar style mineralisation. Um, that's what we discovered back in, in 2018. Uh, Chalice then hit the ground running. Did some more ground EM, more soil sampling, and eventually culminated in some drilling. Um, and also that third of soil sampling, which I just spoke about, they managed to generate a brand new two targets, which was just before the JV on, on earning the 51% ran out. This was about August last year. They made a call to extend the JV. So it's a big tick in the box. But a project that's this sort of blind ultramafic sequence sitting out here, which still needs some attention. Um, so work's been, we've done the ground, oh, Chalice have done the ground and airborne EM and uh, soils and uh, late last year, so we expect some results to come out on that shortly. Um, just, and then very briefly, as I'm running out of time, there's the iron ore project. This is the first shipment we got out back in September 21. Um, you know, the prices are obviously getting interesting in terms of the headline price, but also uh, we're seeing the shipping prices come off a little bit, so there, there could be an opportunity, or a free option for the iron ore price uh, going forward to restart of the Riley project. So in summary, obviously the Mount Lindsay Tin Tungsten project is very much fitting in this critical mineral, EB metal uh, category, so it's a great opportunity for such an advanced project. We've got a whole heap of uh, um, 
opportunities in terms of exploration to add to those resources. We're in a jurisdiction that's already uh, carbon uh, net zero emissions, um, so ticking that box. We've found some rare earths and, uh, and, and at Mount Lindsay, so we'll explore that opportunity in addition, and uh, obviously we look forward to what a Chalice can deliver on our uh, Southwest project. Thank you.